So tonight, Michael's topic is, it's called a blind spot because you can't see it. I'm pleased to introduce the rocker, the world traveler, the international speaker, the presentation pro, my friend, my brother, Michelangelo Caruso. Please stand and welcome him. Thank you so much. Paul Perez, you're the best, baby. I love Rotary. It is the best decision I've ever made. There's a famous video about that out there somewhere. And I do speak for free, and Rotary found out. <laughs> That's important to mention because I'm a professional speaker. So I don't, for those of you that don't know, I charge a fee if you're not Rotary. And uh, again, it's my pleasure to be at NC Pets. Uh, what a great group of people. Have you enjoyed your weekend so far? Yeah. Well, there are certainly a lot of talented people here showing you the way, showing you how to have a fantastic year as president. You're only going to get this chance one time because we're teaching you how to never be president of your Rotary Club again. <laughs> Do it right the first time, man. YOLO, baby. So, um, it's good to be back in this part of the country. I've been to Iowa a million times. I've been to Minnesota a million times. Been to Wisconsin a million times when I was a kid. Paul said rocker because I used to be in a band with my brothers and we toured the country on the college circuit opening for acts like Rick Springfield, Corey Hart, Joan Jett, anybody? Okay. Some people don't recognize those names now. And we played at a place called the Casino in Wapaka, and it was our favorite time of the summer. We had return engagements there, and, and so we had fond memories of Wisconsin. Um, I spent a lot of time in Iowa a year ago when I was a sales coach for Iowa State Bank. And I, uh, I, I went to Algona four times. Not many people on the planet. Are you, <laughs> you don't hear that sentence very often. I went to Algona four times. <laughs> But I did. And, um, and Minnesota, we have so much in common. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, man. Minnesota has so much in common with, with uh, Michigan. And, uh, and the two states shared so much. We have, we're like in the same latitude, for starters. Our, sh our states are shaped basically the same. We both have huge fresh water. What do you have? 10,000, Tim, 10,000 lakes in Minnesota. 10,000 lakes. I was trying to get my head around that. What's that even look like? 10,000 lakes. In Michigan, we only have five great ones. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be that kind of a speech. So what we thought we'd do tonight is talk to you about, um, you know, it, uh, we, were, we were saying earlier that when, when you're about to become president, uh, you feel very confident for a few weeks, and then you feel like you know nothing for a few weeks. Then you feel confident again in one area, and then you say, oh, man, I, I don't know much about the foundation. i got to get into that pool now, right? And it goes on and on and on, and that's why we have such a long ramp for you as you're getting ready to become president. So change is interesting because uh, there's a couple different kinds of change, like uh, uh, there's change that happens on purpose, and there's change that happens because, well, Stuff happens, right? And so uh, both are going to happen during your year, and it turns out that you can take advantage of both of them if you're a good leader. So a big key to this now is that you have to learn how to play chess. How many of you know how to play chess? Raise your hand. Excellent. How many of you know how to play checkers? Hands up. Everybody can play checkers. Checkers, how many moves ahead do you think? One move. How many moves ahead do you think in a chess game? Four or five. Right? And that's good leadership. You're planning for things to go wrong. You should plan for people to let you down. You should. You should plan for your own Rotarians to let you down. I'll tell you the first reason it happens. Rotarians are caring, giving, volunteering people. And they over-volunteer all the time. They take on too much. And then halfway to the deadline, they call you and say, you know, I, I just can't do it. And you're like, damn it. But that's how it goes sometimes. And they're good people. 
It just goes that way. So um, I want you to understand something. Uh, I, loved, I loved your five or six words. So I have another four or five words for you today. It's the, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, three words. Only three words tonight because it's a free speech. <laughs> three words. Four words. Opportunity is seldom convenient. Opportunity is seldom convenient. Isn't that true? Like if you won the million, if you won the lottery, right? Um, or let's say better than that, you won a trip, like a cruise, and the cruise was like the next week, uh, next month and the 15th of the month. You'd say, oh man, any week but that week, <laughs> right? And if you got promoted and they were gonna pay you three times as much to do the same job, but you had to move to another state, you'd say, oh, do I have to move? You see? Opportunity is seldom convenient. So understand that stuff's going to fall into your laps, and it pays to have quick reflexes. It pays to be grateful for all the stuff that happens, the good stuff and the bad stuff. All my friends from Minnesota, raise your hand. If you are a boater, keep your hands up. You know the difference between flotsam and jetsam. <laughs> What's the difference? Shout it out. Oh, you're half right. So it turns out, it turns out that jetsam is the stuff that, that you throw off the boat on purpose. That's the half right part. But flotsam is the stuff that, fall, that gets off the boat accidentally, right? And if you're going to do change in your club, you got to figure out how to balance the flotsam and the jetsam as president. I can tell you that a few years ago, the Troy Rotary Club in Michigan, and I can speak uh, very knowingly about this club. Let's see, it was a year ago, July 1st, a year ago, the president of Rotary Club, starting on July 1st, held the first meeting and didn't ring a bell. I know, sacrilege. <laughs> the reason that she didn't ring the bell was because the bell wasn't out. The reason the bell wasn't out is because she decided we're not ringing the bell anymore. <laughs> she decided. Not a board vote. She decided. She's the president. Raise your hand if you're going to be president of your club. You have the power. <laughs> now, I got nothing against bell ringing. I got nothing against anything in Rotary. It's all good. It's all situational, ladies and gentlemen. And you should talk to people about stuff before you just get up in the morning and do it. But I can tell you that not a single person has asked, where's the bell? because the bell was replaced by other good stuff. High energy meetings, the microphones moving around all the time, 10 or 15 people talk at our meetings. We don't have any dead space. It's run like a radio program, man. If somebody's in the back of the room, they're told to come to the front of the room before we call their name. Why waste the time? And so when bad stuff happens, whether you threw it off the boat on purpose or not, if it's replaced by other stuff, nobody will care as much. Do you understand? This is important for you to understand because you've been waiting all this time for some changes to happen in your club and now you're the person that can make it happen. So put on your big boy and big girl pants and start making some decisions about what can be changed. And what are we talking about? We're talking about things that would take your club to a higher standard and a higher value proposition. We talked about this at the membership segment the other night. The value prop. What do people get when they come to your club? The change is not easy, ladies and gentlemen. We're up against a lot of stuff in this society that we're in today. We're more sensitized now about stuff that's going on. You have to be so careful about what you say. You have to be careful about even being honest with people anymore because of the way that society's set up. Everybody's a publisher, everybody's offended, right, very easily. So it gets harder and harder to take a stand on stuff that you actually believe in. But I want you to have the courage to do this. Director Stephanie reminds me, encourage is a French word, encourage. It means to literally give courage. I'm giving courage to you to try new things. You're going to give courage to your club members to hang in there while you try something new so that we can see if it works better. It's that simple. But we're up against two things. We're up against a lot of stuff. I'll give you two examples. <laughs> there are people that walk around their entire life saying this phrase, I'm not a morning person. There are people in this room that say that phrase. 
Yeah, go ahead. Show of hands. Who's not a morning person? I told you. I told you. And that's unfortunate. You know why? Because morning happens almost every day. <laughs> but you've said it so long, you actually believe it, right? These are like people that say, I'm not, I don't like Mondays. Well, you, but over time, you just canceled out one-seventh of your life, you know? And so we're up against that. We're up against that psychology of what's happening behind the scenes. It's a blind spot, what people be really believe and what they will act on or what they won't act on. We were telling some of the presidents in the afternoon session today that your biggest challenge isn't coming up with new ideas here. All of you are going home with ideas. The problem is the pushback you're going to get as soon as you go to your club and say, let's try this. And then you start hearing from all the past presidents. So it's interesting uh, how it works. I'll give you a second example about change and how it works. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, fresh off of Facebook. A woman posted, a young a woman, young woman in Rotary posted. This is a kind of a word for word what she said. She says, there's only one phrase I hate worse than millennials. By the way, she was a millennial. <laughs> there's only one phrase I hate worse than millennials, and that is young professionals. That was her entire post. And I'm reading it, and I'm like, well, that's intriguing. Largest demographic group in, the, in America, and she wants to take away all their labels. We can't call them anything anymore. So I messaged her, because that's kind of who I am. And I said, listen, I'm not sure we've met. My name's Michael Caruso. I'm a Rotarian in Michigan. I said, um, I was intrigued by your post. I said, um, Largest demographic in the United States. You don't want to be called young professional or millennial, I said. Fair enough. What would you like to be called? She texted back or messaged back. She says, good question. I haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do with these people? So I messaged her back, you know, good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where she's going, but this is what happens. People just like, they take a stand. They don't even know what they're saying sometimes. They're just emotional about it, and I don't begrudge that. But as president now, you have to deal with these, this, these mindsets, right, these things that people say. So I think it's interesting. So there are tools to deal with this change, and they're called heuristics, everybody. Heur heuristics are like, like little, little tiny secret formulas that allow you to understand human nature, right, and figure people out faster rather than sooner. I've always said that almost anybody can become a good president in about 10 months. <laughs> but you're, you, know, you want to hit the ground running on July 1st, don't you? And by the way, if you're going to be president, you're going to give, I teach presentation skills for a living, you're going to give 52 speeches plus 12 board meetings next year, right, that you didn't give this year, and you're going to get good eventually, <laughs> right? And your club, having no choice, is just going to sit there and wait for that to happen, you know? <laughs> They're just going to tolerate you. And they say, the new guy says, is it always this bad? And yeah, same thing happened last year. <laughs> they come around on week 27 usually, you know, and it's pretty common. So uh, it turns out that there are things that called cognitive biases that were discovered by a guy uh, who actually won a Nobel Prize for this. Dr. Daniel Kahneman wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't recommend it. <laughs> It's a challenging book to read. But you could Google cognitive biases and learn. There's over 120 of them. I'm just going to share a couple, three of them. You know the term. And they're fascinating shortcuts to understanding human nature. The best book I've ever read is called Human, it's called um, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. And it's about how we make the same mistakes over and over and over again. You know, it's just, it's just being human. And so if you're leading a team, you have to be able to get past those mistakes and course correct, all the while working with volunteers, right? So it's a challenging situation. And you have to hit the ground running on July 1st. So I'm going to share a couple of these, optim these cognitive biases with you. You'll see yourself in some of them. Please don't take offense. I, I'm going to try to offend everyone tonight. <laughs> Here's the first one. Optimism bias. Here's how optimism bias works. You are so sure that you're going to kick butt as president, you feel you don't have to try that hard. 
Like, there are a few presidents that even didn't even come to this training. Because, you know, they got this, right? It wouldn't surprise you to learn there's an opposite of optimism bias. It's called pessimism bias. And pessimism bias works like this. Holy crap, this rotary thing's a monster. I'm never going to be a successful president. I might as well give up right now. And some of you are feeling that as well. It's fine. There's a third optimism bias, hence the name of the program, and it's called the blind spot bias. And the blind spot bias works like this. And I, I, learn, I live this because I'm a consultant. And uh, so my job is if a company hires me, they call me in, often to work with the sales team or the leadership team. Something's broke. Sometimes it's conflict resolution stuff, whatever. And they'll say, OK, uh, what do you need to get this job done? And I go, well, I'm, I'm going to need about four weeks just to get oriented. i got to interview people. i got to do some competitive analysis. And then I'll tell you what I think we should do. And then if you agree with what I think we should do, you can hire me, and I'll fix it for you. Or if you think I'm full of crap, you can, you can fire me, and, and that's, we'll just part ways, no hard feelings. And so after four weeks, I bring all my research to this guy who has the potential to hire me, this guy that likes me on premise, right? That's why he had me come in and given me complete access to his people. And, he, and uh, we have this little meeting, and he says, what do you think is going on? And I tell him exactly what's going on, and he says, I don't see it. <laughs> and then he says, we won't be needing your services. And then often, six months later, I get an email, totally unsolicited, that says, you were right. <laughs> it's called a blind spot because he can't see it. I even tell him he's not going to be able to see it. And then he still can't see it. And he says, I don't see it. We're, we're going to go another direction. And it's going to happen to you as president. It may already be happening as president. So there's a way to get around blind spot bias, and that is to ask questions of everyone. Keep asking questions and keep listening. I want to knock off a few uh, five cool ideas for you. So um, we're recording this today, and then we're going to chase down the video later. But if you've got a pen, you want to write these down, because these are five very valuable tips. I'll give you the short version so you can copy them on anything. Just use your cloth napkins. I'm sure the guy from the hotel won't mind. <laughs> use the yellow ones. They, they'll show up better. <clears throat> First one is this, number one issue for you as district, uh, as club president, and it's also true for the incoming four governors, is you've got to develop talent in your club. You've got to discover what I call the hidden talent. Like when you get to be president, all these people will come forward and say, hey, I'll chair your such and such event, I'll do this. They're the same people that did it last year. And if you want the same results as last year, get those people to do it. They've already shown almost every trick they have to get that event to happen. But if you want to do better than last year, you've got to cultivate new talent. An easy way to do that is partner the veteran person with a new person and make it clear that you want the new person to have at least some ideas in the mix, okay? So developing talent is especially important when you're trying to marshal a team. And what does this mean? It means you have to go out into the group. You have to find people that don't normally volunteer for stuff. And you have to romance them, man. Find the young people in your club and you say, this guy's not that young, but I'll use him. <laughs> you say, uh, hey, I really like your style. I don't know you very well. I'd like to get to know you better. Can, maybe we can meet for coffee sometime and chat. Would that be okay with you? This is called the yes question. You always nod your head yes when you ask a yes question. Would that be okay? You see, he's not even in my club and he's saying yes. See how powerful this technique is. <laughs> And then later, I'll say it again so he knows it, right? And by the way, what do you do for a living, sir? I uh, own some cell phone stores. You own some cell phone stores. Excellent. So you're managing people and payroll and all kinds of things, yeah? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I like how you think. I want to know more about this. And so I'm marrying his talent to the thing that I need in the club. He's never volunteered for anything before, but nobody's, nobody's approached him like this before, right? I call it romance. You can call it whatever you want. I've never, nobody's ever come up to him and shown interest in him as a human being. What do you do for a living? Very powerful question. What do you do? What are your hidden talents? Ask people these questions. Very cool. Number two, on your napkin. <laughs> Number two, uh, I want you to identify three goals. We call them legacy goals in the business because this is how you will be remembered in your president year. Legacy goals. 
Now, it could be they'll remember you later on. You're the person that brought technology to the club. You're the first person to allow us to take credit cards through um, uh, Square, right? Or you're the first person to get us uh, to every Rotarian every year. There's all kinds of goals. But here's the thing. These three goals have to have a number in them. Don't say you want to be a pretty good president or you want to have some fun events. I don't know what that means, right? I want to know what the number is because numbers don't lie. Numbers are really valuable. Where are you going to put this video? I would like to know, yes. Well, can we find it on your Facebook page, on your Rotary Facebook page? You won't be sharing it now that you said rodeo instead of rotary. That's all right. She's got the right idea. So here's a pretty good presentation tonight, and she's going to make sure other people see it. Maybe some people in her rodeo club. I got to visit that club soon. Okay, number three, praise both public and private. Compliments don't cost anything, but I think a lot of times we treat compliments like we're getting charged for them, right? You can say nice things to people, everybody. We're not that politically incorrect yet where you can't say nice things to people. And it turns out some people love it when you praise them in front of other people. And some people hate it when you do it in front of other people. Find out who likes what and then give it to them. It's not that hard. Bless you. This is nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> You're fine. But the, but the lady making the rodeo video is pissed. I got steal my thunder. Okay. Number four. I was talking about earlier. Number four is you're going to ask questions, and then you're going to listen to the answers. I ask questions even if I already know the answer. I ask you what I think I should do even if I already know what I'm going to do. It's not disrespectful. I am interested in your opinion. You understand the difference? And when you ask people what they think, they think you care. It's a natural conclusion. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Only ask them if you actually do care. Right? This is not, this is not fake. Right? Only ask them if you, you do care what people think, don't you? So ask them. Don't say later, eh, I'm going to do what I want. But then they're, 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 they're glad that you asked. You know, I had a little moment there. That's good. And number five, the fifth cool idea, is something called image marketing. Now, image marketing is a pretty fun thing. It's a play on words, right? So it's your image as president, which, by the way, may need to be burnished after last year's president. And it's also using your cell phone, your smartphone, like a smart person. And so you should learn a little bit about photography because you're going to be taking a lot of pictures, hopefully. A lot of times what we do as governors and leaders, I know I've taken my share of selfies, but I also take a lot of pictures of other people because I want to fly their flag for them. For example, all of the governors coming into office should take headshots of your assistant governors and keep them in a folder on your district Facebook page. That way, when they do something nice, it's right there waiting for you. You just post it quickly and say, this is my favorite you know, assistant governor of the week. You can do the same thing with committee chairs, event chairs, uh, people that do amazing things for the foundation. Headshots of everybody in your club, put them in a folder on, the, on your Facebook page. And you have access to it all the time. It's pretty cool. There's a thing in photography called the rule of thirds. It says symmetry is boring. So never have the subject directly in the middle of the frame, a little bit off center. For some of you, that will be easier than others. <laughs> some of you left of center or right of center. Also, there's a very easy way to crop your photos on iPhone, any phone, Android. And if you just post the photos that you take, you're showing people a lot of stuff that you don't want them to see. Cropping is such an easy thing to do. And you cut out the things that you don't want people to see. You are, you are cultivating your image in more ways than one. You understand? And don't even get me started on things like light source and posting photos of picture with people with their eyes closed. And the big lecture we got at the Rotary Leadership Training Institute, a regional leadership, Training Institute last week was that we are now people of action. Have you heard the phrase? <laughs> Which means you got to stop posting pictures of people sitting around, people. 
Like, I took a picture of the throw of this room. This room is shaped like Vermont, for God's sakes. And I took a picture, not because I'm going to post a picture of a bunch of Rotarians sitting around. I'm going to post it. I'm going to present like a pro Facebook page to talk about the challenges of working a room like this, right? So I took it for another reason. If you take pictures of Rotarians, take pictures of shiny, happy people. Remember the, was it REM? Yeah. So this is the idea. People sitting around is not action. That's what they're trying to tell you, and that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm going to be Rotary uh, Public Image Chair with Stephanie in Zone 29 starting July 21st. So I've taken more of an interest in this, and all of my speeches going forward, I don't care what zone I'm in, we're going to talk about public image, and that's what you're going to get. Um, Margaret, uh, would you come up and join me at the front of the room? We're going to show people something cool. Give Margaret a hand, everybody. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. What a nice surprise. Uh, tell everybody what your club is and what you do during the day. <laughs> what I do during, okay. I'm from uh, Edina Morningside Club in Edina, Minnesota, and what I do during the day. Are you working? Yes. Is, is this something you could talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yes. You don't work at a rodeo or anything, do you? <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, I'm a financial advisor for Alaris Financial, so. Yeah, I can see why you'd want to keep that a secret. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. We're going to show everybody a couple of techniques for presentation skills. You're going to be 52 club presentations next year. I'm going to give you a quick lesson, okay? This is the stuff that Paul was just talking about. So, uh, special tips I want to give you. Number one, you got a beautiful smile. It's going to be natural for you. Under every condition except one, and that is the first few minutes of the meeting. Why? I don't know. Why? I, I, I'm not sure. Why? You might be nervous during the first few minutes of the meeting. You're nervous right now. Not really. Oh, good. Okay, good. <laughs> Maybe. She's apprehensive. Right. She's apprehensive, which is much different than being nervous. <laughs> but you have a beautiful smile. You're, you're showing well. Don't worry. But this is what I tell you. It's hard to smile and be authentic. I teach presenters, you have to be authentic. If you're not authentic, you're not believable. If you're not believable, nobody's going to do what you want them to do. Are you with me? But you can't be authentic if your central nervous system is under siege. You with me? So what do you do to fake everybody out? You give them a nice big smile like Margaret is. You see it? Isn't that nice? Even if you're nervous, you smile. So it's a beautiful thing. Second thing, Margaret. We talked about the head nod earlier. So you would say... Um, it's a beautiful day in Minnesota, and you nod your head less, yes like this. Can you say that? Nod your head yes. I can't lie. <laughs> 350 people in the room, and I picked the only honest person. Sure you can lie. It's a beautiful day. I didn't say weather. I just said it's a beautiful day. Oh. Okay, well, I can see beautiful people here, in, but I'm in Iowa, though, so. I only have a few minutes, uh, Margaret. <laughs> can you say, it's a beautiful day in Iowa, nod your head, yes. Yes, it's okay. a beautiful day in Iowa. Okay, you got to sell it, woman. It is a beautiful day in Iowa. Better. Is it, is it better? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm going to show you one other technique. You did it right at the end. So this is this, uh, I call it the sun coming up. So when you say it, it's a beautiful you open your arms like this. It's called the sun coming up. Try it, everybody, in your chairs. Beautiful day in Iowa. Yeah. It's not a natural thing for guys to do. It's a little theatrical for some of us. But it shows well. Watch the difference. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rotary. It's a beautiful day in Iowa. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rotary. It's a beautiful day in Iowa. Isn't it? Yeah, I see the big difference there. One other te technique, step up here, one step if you would. This is called the half step. So I want you to say, Margaret, without moving, I want you to say, I think you're really going to like this fundraiser idea. Can you say that? Sure. I think you're really going to like this fundraiser idea. Okay, no movement at all. Just say it. No body language. Here we go. I think you're going to really like this fundraiser idea. Now watch this. This is called the half step. Margaret's going to say the same thing, but this time when she says it, she's going to take a half step backwards. Watch the impact. Here we go. 
I think you're going to really like this fundraiser idea. You see that? Now watch this. Stand up here again. This time it'll be a half step forward, Margaret. Here we go. And you can do the sun coming up. Here we go. I think you're going to really like this fundraiser idea. Don't forget to step forward one more time. Oh, what? <laughs> I th Back up. Back up. Take two. <laughs> okay. I think you're going to really like <laughs> Round of applause for Margaret. Thank you very much. I think old Margaret just reached her threshold for entertainment tonight. Thank you, Margaret. With Jill Olson's permission, I'm going to give away a couple of information products. Is that okay with you? So uh, um, I want to do this as kind of a giveaway. It's a thank you to the presidents, and uh, I'll trade you your email address for a chance to win. We're going to give away two packages, and if you share your email address, I'll know that you like this content. I will continue to help you be a better president throughout your year with these occasional emails. Got a deal? Okay, get them out quietly, and I'll tell you what you're going to win. And then we're going to do a quick wrap-up and some Q&A. So I have two sets of these. This is a little booklet called Work Hacks. It's how to get more done at work or in anything that you're doing. They're all pre-approved. It says hacks, but your boss will like these. It'll make you more efficient. This is called Little Ideas with Big Results. It's got some aphorisms in it and some uh, stories that illustrate. Here's one that's perfect for presidents. People don't like to take orders. They like to take part. True or false? True. Yeah. So we need to be reminded of this stuff. And this is my Present Like a Pro DVD. This is a master class in public speaking, everybody. It's a $50 value online, and I'm giving away two copies tonight. It's my pleasure. Can we have a volunteer from this side of the room? Raise your hand, please. Sir, would you collect the business cards from this half of the room and bring them this way? Someone in the back over here. Thank you. Would you mind? Just wave the cards and someone will come by and pick them up. Thank you very much. Now, stay with me. Stay with me. I heard someone use the term STP today. STP. You know what it stands for? Same 10 people. So if the same 10 people in your club doing something all the time, if your club is struggling with innovation, I'm going to give you some inspiration. Here it is. Again, the Troy Rotary Club in Michigan. And we give club, uh, credit, credit to the club president, Renee Pothetis, has brought four times as much money into the club this year, and they haven't even had their fundraiser yet. And her idea is brilliant. I have never shared this publicly. I'm going to share it with you tonight. Most clubs have traditional thinking, and they say we have to have a fundraising event so we can raise money so we can give it away. Raise your hand if your club works like this. Very common. Renee said, why don't we skip that one step about fundraising event? Because you burn a lot of calories. You burn people out doing these events. They're underattended. Nobody likes the events. We go because we have to a lot of times, right? There are exceptions, but a lot of the time that's true. Renee said, we're going to go knock on corporations and we're going to act like a corporation ourselves because we are. She brought in over $50,000 for a buddy bench present, a buddy bench project for the club. And the clubs didn't say, when, when you're having a fundraising event so we can give you the money, they just said, we love the concept. Who do we make the checkout to? You all know what buddy benches are? made up by a kid on a playground. Kid got bullied all the time. His idea was to install a bench. It was called the buddy bench. If a kid on the playground had a problem, he just sits on the bench and all the other kids know that he's got a problem. Somebody goes over and sits with him for a minute. Isn't that lovely? So the reason I share this with you is the idea was so good that corporations were tripping over themselves to write checks all 16 schools in the city of Troy are in. That ties us into Interact, right, and, and Ryla talent, right? So it's a fantastic idea. You're welcome to use it if you want in your community. It's a, it's a really good way to go. So we want you to innovate. We want you to have fun. We want you to try new stuff. Uh, we're going to do the giveaway now. Could you bring up the cards? Very good. Maybe just put them on the table here and fan them out. Thank you very much. Jennifer, thank you. 
Alexa, would you stay with me and maybe draw two winners quickly? Just throw them all on the table. We're going to mix them up. Thank you very much. Alexa, draw two winners, please. Here we go. Thank you very much. Stay with me. This looks like it says Cheryl Amundsen. Where are you, Cheryl? Yeah, come on up. Second one. Keisha or Kesha Billings. Kesha Billings. Over here. Give them a round of applause. Come on up, ladies. Thank you, Alexa. Get your questions ready. We'll take some quick questions. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to sign the book for you afterward. Tell everybody your club and what you do during the day. My club is uh, the Lesseur Club in Lesseur, Minnesota, Valley of the Jolly Green Giant. Yeah. And my day job, I have the best job in the world. What is it? I help businesses, organizations, associations, and foundations give back to students so they can attend college. Fabulous. Thank you very much. You're your hero. <laughs> Hi, Kesha. Where are you from? What do you do during the day? Um, I work for the City of Marion and from East, Marion East Cedar Rapids Rotary Club. And what I do during the day, for, so I work for the City of Marion. Um, I do trails. So federal dollars pay for trails in Marion. Fabulous. Have you ever been to a rodeo? <laughs> it's Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Kesha. Questions, questions, stand up if you have a question. I'm happy to take questions from the audience. It's often the favorite part of the program for people. And we'll get a microphone to you. Anything at all? It's okay. We're good? I'm here tomorrow, by the way. I'm in a session tomorrow, but I can't remember what it is. Jill? We're getting ready to wrap up. Question, Erna, stand up, please. Yeah, what's the question? Um, what is the difference between a facilitator and a speaker like yourself? So the question is what, thank you, what's the difference between a facilitator and a speaker like me? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a trick question. I have facilitated meetings. This is not a facilitated meeting. Facilitated meetings are uh, where the, you've had them today, right? People would stand up in front of you and guide you through some questions or maybe exercises that would allow you to self-discover, right? It's used a lot in rotary sessions, for example. Uh, the opposite of a facilitated meeting is a talking uh, lecture where you're referencing, say, business books from the outside or maybe expertise. Maybe the expert comes in and tells you exactly what to do. A uh, quick example, Stephanie will think this is funny. At regional leadership training, I sat in a bunch of room, a room with a bunch of other regional training, uh, regional uh, RPICs, right? And uh, the facilitator walked us through a bunch of exercises so we talked among ourselves about what it would be like to be an our pick. You catch, you catch what I'm saying here? No, none of us had ever been an our pick, but we're supposed to discover the best way to be an our pick. This is facilitation, in my opinion. So on one of the breaks, I approached somebody at uh, RI staff, and they're fantastic, by the way. And I said to her, you work with the RPICs, right? And he, she said, yes. And I said, listen, I'd like the phone number and the email of the best RPIC in the world. And she, she was taken aback, and she said, well, what do you want that for? And I said, because they know what they're doing. I want to find out the success formula. I've been talking to a bunch of people that don't know what to do. <laughs> and she blushed, and she said... We don't have that kind of information. I can't share that with you. <laughs> and I said, of course you do. You know who the best our pick is. Just tell me. And she started to blush. I don't want to make her feel bad. But we need to think differently about our talent, I think, in this great organization. The greatest organization, not just presently, but in the history of the world. This rotary thing, ladies and gentlemen. We have skill sets that have been undiscovered and undeveloped and uncultivated and not identified yet. And we need to find out where that talent is. And we need to ask those people, what should we do next? And many of you are in the room tonight. I hope you have a fantastic year as president. You are going to rock it. We've trained you. You've got another good day of training tomorrow. Keep asking questions. Keep learning. And thank you for being in the greatest service organization in the history of the world. We have a question. Thank you.
So, Michael, we have a tradition. Michael, we have a tradition here at Pets. We make a donation in your honor to Polio Plus. And we don't ever want you to be in anyone's blind spot, especially our blind spot. So we have an extra special present for you. <laughs> our rotary hockey jersey. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hockey jersey. Ken wants to know why number nine. Gordie Howe, baby, best hockey player in the history of the game. Detroit, Michigan, Detroit Red Wings. Thank you for all you do for Rotary. <laughs>